if I get a bomb from Barbell Medicine. Do you or does someone you know suffer from low bench syndrome or low B? Low B affects millions of American gym goers and can lead to serious consequences. Not sure if you have low B? Symptoms of low B include avoiding the bench press, telling people you have long arms, wearing long sleeve shirts year round, sumo deadlifting, using the peach gang hashtag, or trolling people on the internet. Up until recently, there was little to nothing that could be done about low B or low bench syndrome. Until very recently, a complete cure has been found. It's called benching correctly. Benching correctly has been shown in clinical trials to completely reverse low bench syndrome. But don't just take my word for it. Let's hear from a few satisfied patients. Getting much stronger, my hair on my chest. My success rate has gone up with ladies. It was one of the most frustrating things about my training session. They would just bench incorrectly over and over and over again. So you're saying people will swipe right on yes. IV? 100%. Like they're not intimidated by it, not freaked out by it, not at all. So from all of us here at Barbell Medicine and Untamed Strength, be sure to ask your doctor about benching correctly. It might just save your bench. Hi, I'm Dr. Feigenbaum, and this is Benching 101. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the correct equipment for the bench press, grip and grip width, setting up for the bench, executing a rep, coaching, and frequently asked questions. With respect to the equipment, the competition benches for the USAPL and USPA both use benches that are in combo racks, usually made by ER or a Lyco or a similar manufacturer. Other federations use different benches that may have a different width, height, or even material for the bench press itself. These are also different from commercial gym benches. If you're in a commercial gym, you can use either a yoga mat or resistance bands looped around a bench for traction. As far as the barbells are concerned, the standard dimensions on a power bar are that it's 7 foot long, it's got 31 inches between the power rings, 16 and a half inches or so between each knurling. However, in a commercial gym or in federations that use specialty bars, they may have different measurements. So when determining your grip width, you may need to take that into consideration or just have a standard power bar. You'll notice here that we're using a power rack with spotter arms on the outside of the bench. We could have benched inside using safety pins, or alternatively, if we had a bench station itself, we would use face savers. Ideally, the height of the spotter arms is low enough that it doesn't interfere with the bar during a normal bench press rep, but if you fail to rep, you could just relax your arch and the bar comes down to the pins. Using collars during the bench press is personal preference. Ideally, you'd have a spotter and you wouldn't have to worry about missing a rep. However, if you're benching alone, even with spotting arms, you may choose to not use collars, so that way if you get into trouble, you can dump the weights off each side of the bar. Yes, it might make a loud noise, but it's better than the alternative. One of the more intensive discussions we're going to have today is about the grip. For the grip, we have a few ideals. We'd like to transfer force from the body to the barbell most efficiently, and we're going to use this compression grip, which is similar to the overhead press. Contrast that to the tension grip, like the deadlift. We'd like to stack the wrist joint in such a way that there's no moment arm between the barbell and the eight bones of the wrist and the radius. The radius is the main weight-bearing bone in the compression grip. Therefore, we'd like to carry the bar as high as possible from an anatomical standpoint. High meaning towards the wrist versus low, which would be towards the fingertips. Ideally, the barbell sits directly across the thenar and hypothenar eminences of the hand. Again, this is the highest position that we can carry the bar. The human hand allows us two basic grip patterns. One is the precision grip, which is for fine movement, and the other is the power grip, which we're gonna to try to use here. This allows us to use the most amount of muscle mass and produce the maximum amount of force possible by using both the extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the hand. Extrinsic muscles of the hand mean muscles outside the hand itself, so those that are in the forearm, whereas intrinsic muscles of the hand are, just like you guessed, within the hand. With the power grip, we're stacking the bones of the wrist directly over the radius and allowing the most amount of muscle mass to be used. By pinching the barbell rather than grasping it, we can achieve all these ideals and have a very secure grip that produces maximal efficiency. A few notes about the grip. Don't do a false grip because we can't hold the bar as high in the hand and it may roll out. Don't grasp the bar as the wrist position has a greater degree of wrist extension, also known as dorsiflexion, and can twitch when the bar touches the chest. 
Another discussion we must have is about grip width. The main considerations here are maximizing efficiency within personal preferences and personal style. There is no one best grip width when viewed through the lens of objective performance. While it is true that the range of motion decreases with a wider grip, an individual may not perform better even with the continued training of the wider grip. From an anecdotal standpoint, there are great benchers with both narrow and wide grip widths. The main factor contributing to great benching success is the ability to consistently train the bench frequently for a long period of time, and some people just don't tolerate a wider grip with the requisite bench programming needed to make progress. In short, you may not be able to sustain higher volumes of training with a wider bench grip or narrower bench grip, and so it just depends. That said, there are some biomechanical considerations we can review to give ourselves the best chance for success. We'd like to have a bench width that produces a vertical forearm when viewed from both the front and the side of the lifter. The amount of shoulder adduction, or elbow tuck, also contributes to this and ultimately determines the touch point. The proper touch point on the bench press is one that produces a near vertical forearm when viewed from the side and from the front, as mentioned before. We want the tip of the elbow, the olecranon process, to be in front of the barbell from the side, which means the radius is vertical. Touching lower or higher on the chest produces either a non-vertical forearm in one or both of these views. For most, the proper touch point will be somewhere on the sternum. There are two main moment arms that we're discussing here. One is viewed from the top, from the shoulder to the hand, and one can be viewed from the side, from the shoulder to the hand. With a wider grip, you're going to have a longer moment arm when viewed from the top, from the shoulder to the hand, whereas you're going to have a shorter moment arm when viewed from the side, from the shoulder to the hand. The exact opposite is true with the closer grip. A close grip bench requires a lower touch point, more shoulder adduction, and thus has a longer moment arm when viewed from the side, from the shoulder to the hand, whereas a shorter moment arm from the top, from the shoulder to the hand. Again, this is ultimately a compromise. We're trying to find a happy medium with respect to efficiency and longevity of benching. Now we're talking about the starting position. First, we need to talk about the eyes. Set up on the bench with eyes in front of the barbell so that you're in no danger of hitting the pins during the rep. Stare at the ceiling with the bar in the peripheral vision to help aid in consistent, repeatable bar path without any neck movement during each rep. As far as body placement goes on the bench, the shoulders and butt should be in contact with the bench apparatus. The barbell should be directly over the shoulder joint, and again, the eyes should be in front of the bar. The feet should be on the ground, but we may use blocks for shoulder lifters or those with recurrent back pain. We'll talk more about foot position when we talk about the arch later. With respect to the arch, there's a bit of controversy about the arch in the bench press, and so we should talk about what it is, how to do it, as well as the risk and benefits of doing an arch. To do the arch, we're going to focus on four things, thoracic extension, scapular retraction, lumbar extension, and the valsalva maneuver. Thoracic extension is fairly straightforward. You can see here that when I arch my upper back, that is thoracic extension. During the bench press, we're trying to push our chest up to replicate this while lying horizontally. Push your chest up as much as possible, like you're trying to touch your chest to the barbell. Scapular retraction, on the other hand, is a bit more nuanced. While lying down on the bench, really try to pull your shoulder blades together. You can see me retracting my scapulae here while standing up, and while I'm lying down, I am really trying to pinch that vinyl or leather between my shoulder blades. The opposite of scapular retraction is scapular protraction. This is a common mistake that people make on the way up. They let their shoulder blades come off the bench press. Really try to keep your shoulder blades pulled back to the bench during the entirety of the rep. The next thing we're going to do is perform a valsalva maneuver. A valsalva maneuver is a large held breath against a closed glottis. This increases the intra-abdominal and intra-thoracic pressure and ultimately makes the thoracic cavity larger. This decreases the range of motion within the bench press and also puts the musculature of the shoulder girdle at a better position to create force. The larger the thoracic cavity, the shorter the moment arm between the shoulder and the barbell, which can improve efficiency. You'll notice that some of the best benchers have barrel chests, and this is one anatomical reason why people may be prone to having a great bench press. Finally, we're going to put the low back, the lumbar spine, into extension. Most of the arch in the bench press actually comes from lumbar extension, and the main result from doing this is decreasing the moment arm between the bar and the shoulder by making the chest higher. The risk, and what you'll hear or read on the internet, is that this can cause a back injury by performing the bench this way. On the one hand, there's minimal compression and vertical loading of the spine when you're lying down, so overextension isn't too big of a problem from a purely mechanical analysis. However, there are people who do not tolerate this extension repeatedly, i.e. with high bench volumes, and who may get back tweaks or discomfort by performing it this way. In fact, one workaround for back pain during the bench is to do either a feet up bench press variation or use blocks under the lifter's feet to reduce the lumbar extension. That said, the mechanism of low back pain is fairly complex. Most back pain related to training is nonspecific in nature, i.e. it's not an acute disc herniation, ligament injury, or fracture of the vertebra. Even really severe back pain that comes on all of a sudden after 
a squat or deadlift is probably not an acute disc herniation, but rather a product of too much fatigue and psychosocial factors coming together to produce pain. This doesn't mean that the pain isn't real, it's just that it's probably not from a herniation. In short, there's probably some non-zero risk of back pain with performing an arch, but it's probably not a big deal, certainly not as big of a deal as it's made out to be on the internet anyway. On the other hand, the benefits of performing an arch have been covered. We get to shorten the moment arm between the barbell and the shoulder, we also get to reduce the range of motion by expanding the thoracic cavity, and we also put the musculoskeletal system in a greater position to generate force, with the shoulder joint being placed firmly against the bench and the muscle of the shoulder girdle being at an optimal length to produce force. Ultimately, these all allow us to train more muscle mass, more effectively, which ultimately can contribute to improved performance and results from our training. Leg drive is one of the final coaching points for maximizing bench press performance. We're aiming to use the strength of our legs to both bolster our arch and contribute to driving the weight up. As such, we'll be using the cue, try to push yourself backwards on the bench. Obviously, we don't want to move on the bench while we're doing each rep, and we'll use the weight of the barbell applied to our shoulders to tack us down. For experienced benchers with lots of leg drive, we might not be able to push as hard as possible until the weight gets relatively heavy. Chalk on the back and the butt can also help in preventing sliding on the bench. To use leg drive effectively, we'll start with our foot position. Whether or not the feet should be flat on the floor or on the balls of the feet is mainly a function of personal preference and federation rules. For example, the USAPL requires one to bench with feet flat on the floor, whereas other federations do not have this rule. A shoe with an elevated heel may be an advantage for this, and there are rules against having an extremely elevated heel. Additionally, foot position tends to be personal preference in the context of what's comfortable and that which does not make the butt lift off the bench during the rep. I tend to start people with their feet approximately shoulder width apart and as far back towards the shoulders as is comfortable. After setting yourself up on the bench with your eyes in front of the barbell, shoulders on the bench, and your butt on the bench, you can move your feet as far back as possible while keeping them flat on the floor. Provided this is relatively comfortable, this can be your leg position for the bench. Once the weight is unracked and the arch is performed, I'll have the lifter drive their heels into the ground prior to performing the Valsalva maneuver. The leg drive is performed during the entire day of the rep, whereas if it only happens on the way up, the chance for lifting the butt or bridging goes up significantly. Again, during the leg drive, we're trying to push ourselves backwards on the bench and not up. This helps prevent bridging and also contributes to bolstering our arch and ultimately producing better bench pressing performance. Executing the rep. So to execute the bench press correctly, we're gonna first place ourselves on the bench with both our shoulders and butt in contact with the bench and our eyes in front of the barbell. We can use the uprights to help with thoracic and lumbar extension and ultimately get a good arch. We're gonna take the proper grip and grip width. We're gonna unrack the barbell and before benching, we'll pull the shoulder blades back into the bench, that's scapular retraction. We're gonna cue leg drive and then we're gonna perform the Valsalva maneuver as previously discussed. After we do the Valsalva, we're gonna begin the descent. Here we're trying to go to the touch point that we previously determined based on our grip width and upper limb lengths. A cue I like to use is elbows. This gets the lifter to keep the shoulders, wrists, and the rest of the body relatively still and tight, having a nice bench press bar path. Once the bar touches the chest, we're gonna push up and back towards the rack. For touch and go benching, we're gonna take advantage of the stretch reflex, though we don't wanna bounce the bar wildly. A cue I like to use is to pretend that there is a piece of glass under your shirt that you're trying to touch but not break. When pressing up, again, we're trying to push the bar up and back so the bar ends up directly over the shoulder joint. Pushing the bar forward off the bottom is a surefire way to miss a heavy bench press rep. Initially, we'd like to repeat the steps taken to get our arch and to take another breath between each rep. That is, pull the shoulder blades back, push the chest up, take another breath between each rep. However, later on, when you become better at doing this, you can do multiple rep sets under one breath and without having to reset between reps. When coaching the bench press and evaluating the positions we've discussed, it's best to get a view from the side with the entire lifter and barbell in the frame. From here, we can look at the arch, touch point, and forearm position. We should also get a view from bench level in the front to make sure the forearms are vertical from this angle. Spotting the bench is an important job and one that gets butchered all too often. The main function of the spotter is to help the lifter get the bar through that precarious position when the load is directly over his or her face. The ground rules should be established prior to starting the set. Communicate how you want your lift off, i.e. what you're going to signal the spotter to give you the handoff, how many reps you're doing, and if you're doing any sort of special variation like pause reps where the commands are needed or tempo work, for instance. On the agreed upon liftoff, the spotter should help the lifter move the bar from the rack to directly over the shoulder joint. Ideally, the spotter doesn't take a ton of weight off the barbell or put the bar in a strange position, i.e. too far in front or too far back of the lifter's start position, which again should be directly over the shoulder joint. At that point, the spotter should back away slightly from the lifter and get out of their line of sight. At the completion of the last rep, the spotter will help pull the bar back into the racks and make sure the bar is secured against the uprights. In the case of actually needing a spotter, i.e. when the barbell starts traveling downwards due to miscalculating an attempt or an injury, the spotter should immediately step in and help take the bar with the lifter's help to get the bar back into the rack safely. 
Forced reps or a few fingers of assistance, i.e. it's all you bro, are impossible to calculate how much work is actually being done by the lifter. And while there is some training effect for grinding against a failed rep, it's not terribly useful in most situations and we don't really know what to do next from a programming standpoint. A better solution would be to take some weight off the bar and complete the prescribed sets and reps. Some frequently asked questions are about wrist wraps, belts, and assistance exercises. Wrist wraps are useful in that they cast the wrist so it doesn't move under load. Effectively, it helps bolster that bulldog grip that we discussed earlier. There's also probably some psychological benefit to using a wrist wrap when using heavy weights. Using a wrist wrap with the bulldog grip helps contribute to even more stability under heavy weights. Using a belt during a bench press is mostly personal preference. It can help with doing a big Valsalva maneuver and it may prevent back fatigue from the arch in the context of a training week or prior to a deadlift attempt at a meet. When discussing useful assistance exercises, there are two main categories, direct assistance and indirect assistance. Direct assistance work contributes to the bench via its specificity, i.e. similarity to the bench press, but the fact that it has not yet be adapted to. So basically, it's a new type of bench press that the lifter hasn't done before, but it's similar enough to the regular bench press to get it to move. Uh, whereas indirect work is more about increasing muscle mass via hypertrophy and the general development of pressing strength. In general, these assistance exercises are pretty dissimilar from the regular bench press, but do contribute to building muscle quite readily. Examples of useful direct assistance exercises for the bench press include paused bench presses, using a varied grip, i.e. close grip or wide grip, uh, doing overload variations like chains, bands, or slingshot benches, or altering the range of motion. You can do this with board presses, you can do this with floor presses, you can do these with different barbells. Pin bench is another personal favorite of mine. You can set the pins either at chest level or higher, depending on where you want to work on. Feet up bench press is another type of bench press variation that I like to use. It's just taking leg drive out of the equation and carries over quite well to the bench press. For indirect assistance exercises in the bench press, I like overhead press, dumbbell work, so dumbbell incline, dumbbell flat bench press, uh, tricep work, so that's lying tricep extensions, tricep press downs or similar, dips, incline bench, or gaining weight. Gaining weight helps by increasing the muscle cross-sectional area, which is directly tied into strength, and also decreasing the range of motion that you're going to use during the bench press due to mass accumulation. So it's kind of a double whammy there. All right, that's all for this one, folks. Hopefully you guys found it helpful. For all the latest content, check us out on barbellmedicine.com or our YouTube channel, Barbell Medicine. Also, a special thanks to Alan for hosting us. We'll catch you guys next time.